Is that better? Is that, can you hear me now? All right, thank you. My mom always wants to watch and make sure I can speak up. Um, we'll, uh, I don't think we have a quorum yet, but we'll, um, we're not going to take any action, so a quorum is uh, not relevant at this point anyway. But I want to uh, welcome uh, all the joint members of uh, the E12 and the uh, Human Services um, Policy uh, and whatever your reform committee together. Um, and just to give you an orientation of what we're doing, uh, I spoke, spoke with um, the uh, Chair Nelson and um, other staff about how we could try to work together with our two committees, and this is our, our one meeting to do that, but it's going to be followed up by a working group. And we're going to learn today about, and I think this similar committee was conducted a year ago, and uh, productive at that, and we're going to continue the good work of uh, Senator Sharon and others, and Senator Weger, who, uh, who did this, um, in an effort to uh, continue that idea about how can we coordinate and better serve the individuals, particularly uh, ages zero to five. And I think you're going to discover that there's a good deal of uh, programs available uh, to serve these uh, individuals. And uh, the counties are sometimes made at a loss to know how to best coordinate that and serve the families the best. So, um, and I do want to announce as well that there's going to be a, a working group starting a week from tomorrow at 9 o'clock in room 2308 to discuss this very thing. There will be some presentations uh, and as the process goes along, the ability for the audience and interested participants to actually discuss in a concrete way and just even a kind of a ruministic way about how we can best serve these uh, uh, young people who are ages zero to five in a way that's more collaborative and actually assures them the outcomes that we thought we were going to be getting. So we have quite a full agenda and we're going to save our questions for the end. And so we're going to be trading the gavel back and forth a bit. And uh, so we're going to start out if uh, Dennis and your counterpart want to come to the table and uh, bring your presentation. And uh, the, uh, the work group is going to be co-chaired by uh, uh, Senator Ralph and Senator Hoffman, uh, and, uh, but it's meant to be inclusive. And so if you as citizens or uh, interested groups or just anybody want to come and be a part of that, it will not be online, it will not be minutes, it's a working group. And so to be a part of it, you have to go. And uh, if you can't go, uh, feel free to send me or one of the co-chairs a note about what ideas you might have. So um, with that, I want to welcome my uh, co-chair. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, uh, Senator Abler. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, it's great to uh, have this joint hearing today, and I thank uh, Senator Abler for, uh, for this uh, good collaboration. I just wanted to mention, uh, as uh, Senator Abler said, we are focused on those programs for uh, kids uh, birth to five. And uh, what you're going to hear now from our uh, Cracker Jack fiscal analysts is um, I had asked them to put together uh, this spreadsheet, which I do hope the uh, the audience has as well, uh, to help, uh, help us all get an understanding of how are we funding, what are we funding, where are we funding uh, these uh, very important, our youngest citizens, uh, birth to five. And so the spreadsheet that um, will in front of you I think will be helpful in just looking at what that funding is, uh, what it's projected to be, and, uh, and where that's allocated. Um, and then uh, our departments will get in uh, next and tell you a little bit about what some of those programs are. So, Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And uh, actually, I can call us to order now since we have uh, people who are here. And uh, for those who are watching at home or uh, trying to be technologically better than me. Uh, these are online, and if you need help with that, uh, call my teenage son. He can help you. Um, but anyway, so uh, welcome to the committee uh, and both of you uh, fiscal analysts, and I'm not sure how you're going to present, but please do, and uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, and members, for the record, my name is Jenna Larson. I am the E12 fiscal analyst, and uh, with me is my colleague, Dennis Albrecht, and he is the fiscal analyst for HHS. Uh, so in front of you and in your packets, you should have uh, this spreadsheet here that we put together. Uh, it is a summary of the state appropriations for early education and child care. Uh, we put this together and uh, it is based on the November 2016 forecast data. 
Uh, on this spreadsheet, you do have fiscal years 2014 through 2021. Uh, we will talk specifically about the current fiscal year, 2017, and the departments will go into a little bit more detail on uh, the programs themselves and uh, what we can look for in the coming years from the, from the uh, programs. Uh, so to start out, uh, the spreadsheet uh, has a couple different components to it. Uh, so it's divided into the E12 early education, aid and levy, and the health and human services appropriations. And then each of those line items is given a fund, and that is in column A. So you can tell whether it's a general fund item or a federal uh, funding. And on the very back page, we do have totals by funds so that you can look for specific funds if you're interested in that. Uh, so I'll start out first by talking about uh, the E12 education portion of the early education and child care budget, and then Dennis will spend a yes. little time. Thank you very and much. Services. And I'm wondering uh, in the um, essence of time, if you would, as you go through these education items and then the uh, health, the uh, the health and human services ones, maybe just focus on that current budget and then members mm -hmm. can uh, look for the trend uh, on their spreadsheets. Yes, Thank you. we will certainly do that. Thank you, Madam and Chair. Just put you under more pressure. We allowed about five minutes for you. So. Will Thanks. do. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I think we'll both talk specifically about the largest items within the budget, uh, just to draw your attention to those. Uh, so on the education side of things, the largest chunk uh, of the appropriations are the early learning scholarships. And for the fiscal year 2017, uh, the appropriation sits at about $58.9 million. Early Childhood Family Education Aid, or ECFE, uh, is at $28.9 million for fiscal year 2017. Uh, the School Readiness, which is line 13, is $32.6 million in fiscal year 2017. The Head Start Program, uh, line 14, is $25.1 million in fiscal year 2017. And uh, the newest of these appropriations, uh, the Voluntary Pre-K Program, uh, which is line 23, is $27.1 million in fiscal year 2017. And that is the aid portion of education. On the levy side of the education, uh, the Early Childhood Family Education Levy, which is line 30, uh, is the largest of the two levies. And that sits at about $22.1 million for fiscal year 17. Uh, in total, the aid appropriations and levy uh, are going to total about $202.2 .2 million in fiscal year 2017. I do also want to draw your attention to line 38. Uh, at the request of the chair, we included uh, the, an estimate for the kindergarten general ed aid appropriation and levy estimate. And for fiscal year 2017, uh, that is $465.3 million. And at this point, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Albright. Mr. Chair, um, uh, Madam Chair. So for the human services part, um, uh, I think it's important to point out a big difference between K-12 or E-12 and human services, and that is their money is all out of the general fund, and in human services, we have a significant amount of money coming out of the federal funds, um, <clears throat> and there's a little county share and, and some federal TANF money in there as well. So the numbers I'm going to tell you are all funds, um, and you can... Um, I'll tell you which lines to, you can look at to see how those break out between the general fund and the federal government. So the first one is lines 42 and 43. That's the MFIP transition year child care spending. For fiscal year 2017, that's about $167 million, all funds. Lines 44 to 46 are the um, basic sliding fee program. This program is a capped appropriation at the state level. Um, its funding in fiscal year 2017 is about $118 million. Lines 47 and 48 are the Parent Aware Program um, with $9.7 million of funding. Lines 49 and 50 are the Child Care Development Funds. Those are funds for child care providers um, for technical assistance and training and other things. Um, about $9 million in 2017. And then lines 51 to 59 are various... Um, uh, home visiting programs both at the Department of Health and at Human Services. And together, all of those programs um, in 2017 are um, about $20 million. 
Um, at the very end of the spreadsheet, lines uh, 65 to 71 um, are totals by fund. And if you look at the grand total on line 73, you can see that in 2016 and 17, there's about $955 million, all funds. And in the next biennium, that grows by less than $100 million. But importantly, the distribution between the state funds and the federal funds is a lot different. So on line 67, you can see it's a total of $588 million out of the state's general fund. That jumps to 700, almost $701 million in 18 and 19, um, whereas the federal money goes down by like $30 million. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I think that's good for now, and this is meant to be just a lot of content. So, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Senator Weger, we were going to hold our questions oh. till the end. Is that okay? Can you, or do you need something right now? Go ahead. Just, Senator just quickly, I appreciate it showed the federal amount on the health and human services, but there also would be a federal component for education, for example, Head Start. Uh, there was a race to the top money on early ed, et cetera. So, are we able to get yeah. that federal so it all aligns? Uh, sure. Uh, Senator Weger, we definitely can. Uh, my instructions were just the uh, state general fund, but we can definitely uh, augment that, and we will make sure you get that, as does the whole committee on those federal funds. Thank you very much. And now, if we could ask the uh, Department of Education to come up. They're going to add a little color and a little flesh to the line items that we just uh, heard from our fiscal analysts about. Who do we have from the Department of Education here today? Uh, and just to just so you can be on ready, first we have the Department of Education, then we have the Minnesota Children's Cabinet, uh, then we have Department of Health and Department of Human Services. I'm looking for Lisa. Uh, Mr. Uni. I'm I've looking for Lisa. Is she, she she's, here today? She's, she's right here. Okay. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, uh, just uh, briefly, uh, and Mr. Chair, my name is Adele Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations at the Department of Education. Um, I wanted to say that the presentation was a joint effort between the three departments, and there'll be the presenters from each department and the Children's Cabinet. Uh, Mr. Carter will be weaving their testimony together um, rather than going through um, individual line items. So I just wanted well, to be. Thank you very much for modeling collaboration. We <laughs> like that. Yes. Uh, please proceed with whoever is first on your collaborative so, list. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, kindly introduce yourself for the audience in the tape, please. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Melvin Carter. Um, uh, we appreciate you convening this uh, important discussion on state early childhood investments uh, with a focus on coordination. Um, I'll start today's presentation uh, with a brief overview of our work at the Children's Cabinet and also turn it over quickly uh, to our leaders across our partner agencies uh, to talk more specifically about programs and resources that we'll uh, overview today. And uh, just a note for committee members, I think you have a slide deck in your folder, and if not, you've got one right in front of you as well. Yes. Mr. Carter. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minnesota Children's Cabinet is an interagency effort, primarily consisting of our state's departments of education, human services, and health. But I'll note that we're also working increasingly with other agencies like our department. Mr. Carter, of, uh, can you just like pull the microphone a little closer? Yes, I'm sorry. I don't want to miss a word. Okay, is that better? Fantastic. Uh, I, I was saying the Minnesota Children's Cabinet is an interagency effort, uh, primarily consisting of our state's departments of education, human services, and health. Uh, but I want to note that we also work increasingly with our departments of employment and economic development uh, and our Minnesota Housing Finance Agency as well. Our three core functions are to lead interagency coordination efforts to make it easier for families to access support, uh, connect with parents, providers, and programs to help build our state le statewide learning community, and also awareness of the critical importance of early childhood development, uh, and also advise the governor's office on early childhood policies and priorities based on the feedback and learning we hear as we work with early childhood stakeholders across the state. Go ahead. 
Uh, together, our vision is that every Minnesota child has the opportunity to achieve her full potential. We know that's important uh, from an economic perspective, as we've had much conversation about the returns that we get when we invest public resources in young children. To that end, one of the core things we've identified uh, across the state is a strong desire and understanding that the work of ensuring that our children are healthy and learning cannot be divided from the necessity of investing in the stability of the adults in their lives. Uh, to that end, we're working with Ascend at the Aspen Institute to develop what's called the two-generation approach uh, that serves, creates goals, and measures outcomes for children and the adults in their lives uh, at the same time. Ascend is working with leaders in different sectors all across the nation to develop this concept. We are currently working with them and a set of communities across our state to hone it for Minnesota under a two-year grant from the National Governors Association. Uh, as you can see, the five components of the two-generation approach are early childhood education to get children off to a strong start, post-secondary and employment pathways to connect the adults in their lives to economic opportunity, economic supports, both to help families sustain basic necessities and to build assets, uh, investments in health and well-being, as well as social capital to build the support network uh, around challenged children and families. I also want to draw your attention to the implied sixth component of this approach, which is the gears themselves, uh, transforming the investments and programs that often exist in separate agencies with separate funding streams and requirements into a set of coordinated systems of resources that work well together to support children and family success is critical. That's the work we're undertaking together, again, with, leader, with guidance from leaders in five communities across the state who are working to implement these systems uh, and better connect families to resources at the local level. You'll hear today about a number of state administered programs and resources across agencies. I also want you to know that we're working together to constantly improve the way families experience and access to them. With specific regard to our 2Gen work, we are currently exploring options uh, such as better aligning eligibility requirements uh, across agencies to eliminate those cliff points at which increases in income lead to termination of a benefit and a net loss of resources, uh, aligning programs through a common application form to reduce uh, the paperwork burden on the families we serve, uh, and expanding our state's Help Me Grow system, which you'll hear more about later. All of this is very critical and, starts, and starting early, of course, helps keep us from playing catch up later on in a child's life. Um, with that said, uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Lisa Barnage, our supervisor of our Early Learning Services Division at the Minnesota Department of Education. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, afternoon, committee members. My name is Lisa Barnage, and as Melvin said, I am um, a supervisor in the Early Learning Services at the Department of Education. Um, as Melvin was talking, um, we started off here with a slide that really highlights the importance of looking at our programs with a P3 um, prenatal uh, to thir or third grade, birth to age eight uh, framework. Uh, and because these services that we are providing are across all of our agencies, and at, even at, across programs at the local level. We offer a continuum of services, and we need to ensure that these services are aligned and coordinated so children and their families can be supported no matter where they are on this continuum, and that we are aligning supports across programs so that transitions for children and families may be seamless. Our goal today is to provide you an overview of how the programs at all three of our agencies intersect and how, Minnesota, and how they are serving Minnesota's children. We want to identify opportunities for improvement across agency collaborations and our policy program implementation. In order to paint a picture of how our programs intersect today, we will give you four stories of families in Minnesota and how they work to navigate the various systems between our agencies in order to access the services they need for their children to support their growth and their development. The first story we have today is about Heather. Heather is a mother of two children, ages two and four. Her children have recently been placed in foster care while for, with their maternal mother while Heather receives treatment and works on court-ordered plan to rebuild her life, including parenting skills. The children's foster care worker has helped the grandmother um, receive uh, early learning scholarships for the children to help pay for childcare costs while the grandmother is working. Additionally, as a scholarship requirement, the program requires that the children receive early childhood screening. So the older child has now been screened by the local school district. 
Heather and the grandmother are also both attending early childhood family education to enhance their knowledge and skills to improve interaction with the children in a positive manner and help the children's developmental stages. Um, I did want to point out uh, for this, pro this scenario as well, um, the family, the grandmother, because the children are in early learning, or in, I'm sorry, foster care, um, the grandmother cannot apply for child care assistance. Um, so the early learning scholarship program is a program that helps uh, children in foster care for those foster parents to um, help pay for early childhood programming while they attend work or other um, activities. Uh, the Early Learning Scholarship Program uh, increases access to high quality early childhood programs for children uh, zero, um, three to five years old and their younger siblings. Um, the requirement is that the children are three um, by September 1st uh, and that the, the family has a poverty or an income level of 185 percent of federal poverty guidelines are younger. Younger siblings may also receive a scholarship if they t attend the same program as their older sibling who has received the scholarship. In um, fiscal year 2016, we did service um, 11,219 children in the Early Learning Scholarship Program. And as was noted earlier today, in state fiscal year 17, we are at $59.9 million for the Early Learning Scholarship Program. Uh, the program is administered uh, in two different pathways. Pathway one is administered through regional administrators, and pathway two um, are administered through four-star parent-aware rated programs uh, to children who are eligible and choose to attend their program. The scholarships are up to $7,500 uh, for each eligible child, and uh, they can continue to receive the scholarship until they re enter kindergarten, regardless of any changes in their income or um, parent activities. Just a note for the testifiers. Yes. Uh, we have about until 3.40 for the gang of the collaborators, so just want to make sure that you can. Thank you. Okay. Um, as we also mentioned, there was the child did receive early childhood screening. Early childhood screening is a universal program offered to children who are three to five years old, normally offered through the school district. However, children can receive their screening through their primary care physician um, or um, Head Start or other uh, similar programs, and that the documentation can be given to the school district to meet their early childhood screening requirement. We screened approximately 60,000 children last year, and we spent $3.4 million in the state fund. School districts also reported that on top of the 3.4, they um, spent an additional $1.4 million uh, screening children. The, uh, main screening components um, include hearing and vision, uh, child development as immunizations and physical development for the children. Lastly, in this scenario, the children did attend um, early childhood family education with their parents, um, with their mother and their grandmother. Um, early childhood family education is offered in almost all school districts. It's usually birth uh, to five. Uh, for uh, families and their children to attend. They normally do attend a two hour a week class um, where the children and the families or the parents interact for a portion of that time and then they do split up and the parents get some individual with a teacher and other parents conversations about child development and other parenting um, resources and skills to offer to them. Uh, the ECFE program also does have a home visiting component as well. <laughs> so welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. Thanks. Uh, Jean Ayers, Assistant Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Health and Chief Health Equity Strategist. Uh, I'll just uh, have a, a smaller section of this presentation. The Minnesota Department of Health works with local communities and partners and our other state agencies and um, and uh, uh, primarily, we bring a prevention focus. We uh, look at and address issues that have complex interconnected risk factors. And uh, we bring data and research to identify those patterns of risk. 
we bring a systems approach uh, across the entire spectrum of prevention from what we would call community-based primary prevention, like our statewide health um, improvement partnerships, to interventions that are specific for higher risk groups that I will focus my attention on, the family home visiting and our WIC uh, nutrition program. But the overall approach is to support the development of safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments, both programmatically and then with system change so that families can thrive. We know children thrive in the context of a thriving family and a healthy community. Um, so uh, examples of the interagency work include bringing data and analysis into issues about how neighborhoods and housing and income and wealth and structural inequities and structural racism, um, incarceration, all, all impact the health and well-being of children. We support preventive efforts that are specific grant kinds of programs and um, work in partnership Again, to do work around family planning, maternal depression screening, uh, early detection and follow-up. There is a, a connection to the early, uh, there is a, uh, the program that looks and does developmental screening for three and four-year-olds. There's a, there's a precursor to that program called the follow-along program where we detect people, children who have um, issues who've been uh, nutritional, uh, our metabolic issues identified through newborn screening and then we follow along with them. So there's a large number of people engaged in that or, and children and families engaged in that program. And all this work is done in partnership with local, local agencies as well. So the two programs, um, Kyrea's story really is about family home visiting. It's a 16 year old um, teen uh, who uh, first got connected to the family home visiting program um, when she was 16. And she uh, met her home visitor and that home visitor helped her be sure she got to her appointments um, and helped you know, uh, her learn skills around parenting, um, helped provide connection around um, uh, uh, her, her um, her supports and resources around breastfeeding. And I think I just really want to highlight the one um, quote here where she said it was um, by working with her home visitor, she said, she helped me until I got the hang of it. And after I got the hang of it, I could do it on my own. And she, it's like now I know how this goes and I got it. And now her daughter is is in, uh, who's four, she's getting ready to go to kindergarten. And that's the kind of thing that family home visiting uh, uh, provides. It really, they come into the home and um, the purpose is to foster healthy beginnings, improve pregnancy outcomes, promote school readiness, prevent child abuse and neglect, promote positive parenting and resiliency, um, promote family health and economic sufficiency for the family. Um, they basically, there is um, a, a, there's a set of, I think, 20 outcomes that, that are uh, reported to the health department in those, in those various areas. But this, where we've shown evidence uh, and, and results from family home visiting. Uh, to be eligible, people have to be at risk. The family or the pregnant and parenting family is at risk for poor social, physical health or developmental child outcomes. And so there's a variety of different um, uh, criteria depending on the funding source. So that brings me to the funding source. The um, most of this uh, family home visiting is done th use of, through the use of federal funds, uh, 17.5 million, and then we have a state uh, general fund uh, appropriation of 2.4 million. Um, much of the federal funds is a competitive grant program. Um, so I think that's kind of a summary of family home visiting. I wanted to go on to the women, infants, and children program, the nutrition, supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children funded through the, um, primarily through the um, uh, National Department of Agriculture. <laughs> and and um, it is uh, $101 million that comes into the state uh, of federal funds for, for that program and about um, less than 2% of the funding is local. Uh, 138,000 or more uh, children are served 
I think some of the things that I want to point out, it's actually a nutrition services, breastfeeding support, healthy foods and referral to health and other needed services. So it's, a, it's actually, there's consultation and nutrition consultation that help um, new mothers and breastfeeding moms and um, pregnant, pregnant um, mothers and win, women and infants um, up to age five. Here's a number I just want you to sort of think. It est we estimated that 45% of all the children born in the state were served by WIC. Um, and, and again, they, um, oh, here's a couple of great findings. We're second in the nation for our high participation in families. We're at 72%. And we are um, eighth lowest in the nation um, for our obesity rates with children in that area, in that in that um, population of two to four. There was a Centers for Disease Control study that showed that our obesity rates um, had dropped um, uh, in just like, uh, I don't have the number right here in front of me, but it was I think between 2014 and 15, we were able to see a drop from 12.7 to 12.3 percent to of, um, uh, of those of children having an obesity rate, which is a significant impact on health. So I'm going to turn it over because I know uh, Assistant Commissioner Koppel has a lot of slides. Thanks. And welcome, Mr. Koppel. And I want to welcome Epson and Pinto. And Epson Krisha is also interested in, in this work. We're trying to do some uh, bicameral work as well as multi-departmental and multi-committees. Um, I think if we can get through this part in about 10 minutes, and if it, and the, the information is, you can spend a meeting on any one of these areas and not to minimize the value. This is meant to be at just a high level. And so Mr. Koppel, maybe as you go through the pages, you can uh, summarize the stories and just point out kind of how they work, these programs maybe work together to help somebody and, and with the highest level of the programming, maybe not even the funding levels. We went through that already and the people can read those contents, but kind of be thematic as you are very good at being. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to live up to your expectations. Um, I'll, I'll start out with the story uh, of Angela working 35 hours a week. She has three children. Uh, she's on the basic sliding fee program. And one of her children is in early childhood, uh, early learning scholarship, um, or actually two of them have the early learning scholarship. So um, she pays $26 a week as a copay every two weeks. The scholarship also covers that copay as well as the difference between the reimbursement that the state pays the provider and what the provider uh, rates are. So that comes in very handy. The last paragraph of this is going to get covered uh, when we talk about the voluntary pre-K program at the end, uh, as well as what is in your uh, packet. Uh, the very next uh, PowerPoint uh, is uh, um, on scholarships, and we're going to skip that and go stay on the child care uh, pathway here. So child care assistance program, who we serve. Uh, the slide is up now. Uh, you can see that two, about two-thirds of the children we serve are um, one to five, where um, about um, one-third, roughly a six to 12-year-olds, the program cuts off at 13 unless there's a uh, uh, disability. Um, the um, program serves approximately 30,000 children. That's from 16,000 families in an average month. Of the children served in an average month, about 65% of those are from the seven county metro area and 35% are from greater Minnesota. Race and ethnicity, 60% uh, of the children we serve are of color or uh, American Indian. Child care assistance uh, program, what type of child, do they, uh, child care do they use? You can see the breakout here. The majority is in licensed center, 64%. 23% in licensed family care. And then we have two exempt categories, legally non-licensed, that's family and licensed exempt centers. Um, and I'll just skip what they are and you just ask me whatever you want when I'm done. 
uh, child care assistance program, what percent are in high quality. This is the parent aware program. You can see in 2012 and 2013, before we had the star rating system, we just had quality. They were in parent aware, but they weren't rated by one to four. Um, so now as the program grows and as we assigned star rating systems, you can see the growth in, this, in the program, but also in the three and four star rated systems. Child care assistance uh, program funding. Uh, total funding in 2016 was $249 million. Uh, $150 million of that, including federal and state funding for MFIP child care, and $98 million, including federal, state, and county for basic sliding fee. On the next slide, you'll see that um, when we talk about MFIP child care, MFIP child care is available to those families on MFIP who are either working in education programs and um, there's about 15,000. It's about the same number of children in both uh, MFIP and then in basic sliding fee, that's for working families, low incomes, and that's uh, where you have the co-pays, et cetera. Uh, there are about 5,400 families on the uh, waiting list for the basic sliding fee child care. The MFIP child care is forecasted. So if you're on MFIP and you need child care, you get it. But once you leave MFIP, uh, go through uh, that transition year, you're um, on the basic sliding fee program. Child care assistance um, program, there's some uh, changes that we'll be proposing. Uh, these were part of the child care development block grant, federal reauthorization in 2014, and uh, they rec um, will ask states to make a number of changes to their programs. I've just highlighted some of the areas here that I'm sure we'll be in more discussion about, but one stabilizes the program uh, for children. Um, for So we, for instance, do six month reauthorization now, recertification, this would change it to 12 months. That's one of the federal changes. More funds dedicated to child care quality. Uh, a higher percentage is uh, um, recommended by the feds, actually stronger than a recommendation, it's a re requirement. Health and safety requirements, updated reimbursement rates, so there'll be uh, a change in reimbursement rates as well as a uh, uh, transparent consumer and provider education information system, which would be web-based. Moving on, just summarizing, this gives you the eligibility criteria and um, the number of children served, some of which I've already covered, but that's all captured here on one page. So I won't spend uh, any time on it other than to look at the outcome measure, which is the increase in the percentage of children aged zero to five, not yet in kindergarten served by providers who are highly rated. Uh, that the reason uh, we um, talk about highly rated is we'll move to the next slide on parent aware. Uh, we know that the uh, higher the quality of the child care, the better the outcomes are, the better the learning, and the better preparation is for uh, kindergarten. So um, talking briefly about the parent aware program, um, the, again, the eligibility are our licensed providers, Head Start, school-based pre-K programs, uh, family child care, and uh, child care centers. The funding uh, 2017 and 9.6 million. Uh, I just want to highlight the race at the top, the Early Learning Challenge grant of 3.5 million ended uh, at the end of December of 2016. So that money is spent. Um, key program components um, obviously are that uh, we provide parents um, with lots of information, a web base again on where to find child care, what to look for. Uh, and we offer coaching, training, and grants to help programs uh, become part of the parent aware system and also to move through the rating system so they can be highly rated. Uh, and we provide best practices based on the research of what makes a difference for children uh, in their outcomes. And the outcome measure is um, really the percent of children in these high quality uh, programs. And finally, um, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, uh, the Office of Inspector General I'll cover for, um, for them as well here because the federal reauthorization of the child care block grant also calls for changes in licensure. Um, and so I wanted to just give you a brief uh, overview of, of um, licensing, which licenses all child care uh, in the state. Uh, so family child care, there's 8,890 providers for 104,000 
capacity. Mr. Koppel, I think you just, with all respect to the departed Mr. Kerber, um, I think we'll skip licensing just for now. Um, okay. and so we're, we're trying to get a feel for all the programs. And so we'd like to, how do they interact and who thinks about it and like that. So as the presenters continue, if you can kind of, I, I wish we had more time. This is just meant to be a highlight time. So. Uh, we want to kind of wrap this up in seven or eight minutes, so thank you. And Mr. Chair, as I hand it off now on to talk about the scholarships um, in uh, uh, voluntary pre-K, I would say at the end of this, we do have areas of strengths that we have and then areas of improvement or collaboration that we think need to happen for us to move forward. So we did tend to get to that, but we didn't know okay. we were going to be in this time uh, frame. That's so. all right. So maybe just on the areas that are left, just kind of mention them and say, yeah, we have this program and it's amazing. And we have that program, and it's also amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, members of the committee. Uh, one last scenario we have is about Miguel. And Miguel um, is attending an all-day Head Start program through an early learning scholarship um, and has been referred through the current Help Me Grow system to early childhood special education at the district and is identified as having um, some needs and is now being serviced through early childhood special education at his Head Start program. So this highlights the fact that we do have a current um, state system called Help Me Grow. It is a referral system for children um, and parents who have concerns about the development of their child. Uh, the system is um, currently as it is, um, the referrals come into MDE and we actually um, push those referrals out to the school districts. They um, contact the families and determine um, whether or not the child is eligible. For early childhood special education, we actually have two programs for early childhood special education. The first one is for infants and toddlers. It is called Part C. Um, it is a family-focused um, service that is provided normally in the parent's home or in the area that the child is most often. When the child ages to three, um, hopefully, maybe we have resolved um, any of their um, developmental concerns and they can graduate out of the program or um, they are um, identified at three or later um, for early childhood special education or graduate into what is called Part B, um, which is three and five-year-olds. And that is normally in a center-based setting, um, again, provided by the school district. The Head Start program is actually a federal program that we do um, provide state funding, as was mentioned earlier. Um, to your question, Senator Weger, um, currently we have approximately 1.3, almost $1.4 million per year from the feds for Head Start, and we are contributing $25.1 million um, to our Head Start programs. They are geared towards children who are 100% of poverty or lower, homeless, um, and other high uh, risk factors. Um, they provide comprehensive services including health um, and mental um, health for uh, the children that they service. Um, two last programs is the school readiness program. The school readiness program is run by school districts. It's a preschool program for three and five years between three to kindergarten entrance um, to help uh, transition those children into the school setting and prepare them from school, for school readiness. Um, we have seen increases in the last decade to our uh, contribution to school readiness. We're now at $32.6 um, million per year. And um, just to highlight that program is actually, um, I believe, from the 90s. So it is an older program that we have been offering compared to our new program called Voluntary Pre-Kindergarten um, that is new as of July 1st. This last year, programs started offering, school districts started offering this program actually this September. We do have 74 school districts who applied and received um, funding for early learning Voluntary pre-kindergarten, I apologize, um, for 33, approximately 3,300 children across the state um, at 102 sites. We did have approximately 210 school districts apply, um, but we were only able to fund 74 at the current $25 million. That, um, I think we, do we want to hit these? Okay. Thank you, I'm, thank you and I'm sure, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll, I'm going to go through strengths and opportunities. I'm going to skip strengths a little bit because uh, we do have cross-agency leadership. I would not say, though, yet we have cross-agency programming. Uh, what that means is we are in discussions. We have really constructive discussions. I, I think we have strong relationships, and we have a lot that we want to talk about and are talking about. Um, and, and so that kind of gets us over uh, toward opportunities for improvement. So on the opportunities for improvement, 
Um, what I would say is we, we need to uh, increase access to high quality programs and services for all children. Um, two things there, I would say. One is to coordinate scholarships and childcare uh, is essential. I think there's a lot of overlap between the two programs. There's no sharing, uh, data sharing at this time. We'd like to be able to do that. We think it's important. Uh, to not just for the quality of the programs and eligibility, et cetera, but just to maximize our resources and efficiency. Uh, and, and also we need to strengthen our early childhood workforce. You know, this is not a workforce that is growing. It is shrinking. It is also a workforce that's uh, grossly underpaid and has high turnover. And we know that uh, part of the success of early ch childhood programming is stability of a teacher or a, a child care provider uh, are important. And so kind of that whole idea of, of really trying to create an early childhood workforce and an early childhood system is important. And that's how we have to think about it. Uh, and so data sharing, I would want to emphasize, would be a key piece of that uh, as well. <coughs> and with that, the last part of ours, which will help us along this journey, is uh, help me grow, and Mr. Carter will uh, finish that. Mr. Carter. Thank you very much. Um, th and this is the last part of our presentation. We wanted to close with specific uh, regard to a current opportunity we have to enhance our level of interagency coordination and make all of these investments you're hearing about work really well together uh, in a way that creates a system that's greater than the sum of its parts. Wanted to share with you the work of Help Me Grow. You heard a little bit about how it exists in its current form a few slides ago through Help Me Grow. Uh, parents, family members, uh, child care providers, and even health care providers uh, who have a developed developmental concern about a child can call one centralized access number from anywhere in the state and connect directly to their local school district for screening and to determine eligibility for those early childhood special education services that we discussed. Uh, this is a need that's growing fast and parents across our state are taking us up on it. I don't have my graph on this slide, uh, but our number of referrals has skyrocketed exponentially over the past several years from 533 referrals in 2010 to 15,760. 67 referrals uh, this past year in 2016. Uh, MDH, uh, MDE, and DHS are working together to expand this work, uh, which currently has the capacity, like I said, to connect children who qualify for those Part C special ed early childhood special education services uh, to those district-based Part C services. There are a number of those folks who are called to call into that number for those children who may not be eligible for those, may not meet those specific eligibility requirements, uh, but still need some resources and support. So our goal is to expand that to be able to connect any child and any family to a much broader array of locally and state-administered uh, programs and resources. As you can see on the screen, our goal is to provide a hub that effectively connects children, families, and providers to information, services, and supports, uh, provides parents and providers proactively with critical information about child uh, development, help us to really improve alignment between state and community-based resources, connect families and services and, to fa services and supports through an efficient centralized system, and also give us the data to really guide uh, evaluation and continuous improvement. Uh, it helps us, like I said, leverage our whole infrastructure to be greater than the sum of its parts uh, through a few ways. One, it helps us to really leverage our, those health care providers to engage the large number of children uh, in our state uh, who are still not served by licensed child care environments. Uh, it helps us improve child find and early identification as we've kind of engaged with kindergarten teachers around the state. Uh, one of the things that we hear consistently is from kindergarten teachers who are frustrated by the number of children who come into their door uh, with issues that they feel could have been addressed uh, if someone had known this child had those, uh, those challenges a couple of years back. So to really help us uh, identify children earlier uh, and reduce the number of children who enter kindergarten with unaddressed developmental challenges to support children and families of all income levels and to really look across this system of supports that we're talking about to identify gaps and guide resource decisions for the future. Thank you for your time. Well, I really appreciate it and I know I pressed you for time, but I, you've accomplished what I was hoping you would accomplish, which is to give us a flavor for the depth and breadth of the kinds of programs. And this was actually an incomplete list, but it's, okay. there's, there's more and there's not enough time in the day to go over that. But and hopefully as the work group gets involved in some of this, the very goals that you've all attested to about working together to actually serve those young people. Uh, so I think I'll dismiss you at this point. Um, and so hang around, there might be some questions. And if, uh, 
Mr. Harder would like to come up. And uh, is your superintendent here good? And then uh, Mr. Opat, you're on deck. If and uh, as they're getting set up, members, I just want to uh, thank you for your attention and realize that this is a lot to get in a short amount of time and not ask questions. And I absolutely apologize for that. I hope you're using your legal pad here and jotting down those questions. Uh, my plan is that, well, it was going to be that at 4 o'clock we would be opening this up for committee members' questions, but it might be just a tad later. So thank you for your indulgence. No question before it's time. Uh, Mr. Harder, uh, Actually, I'll just let you introduce yourself and tell us why I would have invited you to come to this thing and thank who you. your guest is. All right, thank Thanks. you, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair and Senators. Thank you for allowing us to be here in front of you today and, and hearing the pre And my name's Kelly Harder. I'm the, my day job. I'm a community services director in Dakota County. And uh, basically what that is is when we don't get this front end right and we don't get kids to graduation, two-thirds of all of our tax dollars and everything spent on the rest, which is homelessness and other benefits, and about $325,000 over their lifetime if they don't graduate. So one of the best social policies we can collectively, I think, agree on is if we can get kids graduated, and for us, and what all the data and the research shows, is if we can get them to third grade at proficiency and performing at proficiency, that puts us on about a 90-plus trajectory toward the graduation uh, success rate or not. Um, I have the honor to sit next to Dr. Dave Webb, who's the superintendent of South St. Paul School District, and uh, without him, uh, as well as a few other superintendents in our uh, county, uh, we wouldn't be able to sit in front of all of you today to actually take everything you've heard, which is a lot with programming, uh, and actually tr make it transactionally real to the, to, at the community level. And, and we want to share with you an initiative, uh, and we will be extremely brief so we can get to questions on what this is all about. I'll, I'll establish that. What I would refer to you in your packets is you have two colored prints, um, and, and I'm going to go over how we're trying to address this in Dakota County with four, in, in kind of a phase one with four key school districts. Um, the initiative itself is that we're calling our birth to aid initiative. It's that we will take and get 100% of our tier one target population of families enrolling in family home visiting, WIC and early language learner programs, we'll get them reading at third grade proficiency minimum level. And if not, we will know that they, it won't be a surprise to us. And we as a system will be aware when and if they weren't meeting specific milestones. And if not, we're gonna be like the General Motor manufacturing line or Toyota and we're gonna hit the red button and the system's gonna stop and slow down and figure out why the developmental milestones haven't been met along their journey toward third grade. The other reason we've got to this, I, was, I had the honor to be out at uh, Cambridge and was among 75 other health human service thought leader folks and the White House folks came in and they said we wanna do 10 initiatives in 10 years and with $10 million to bend the curve on generational poverty, what would you do? So we counted off randomly 12 groups. We went out and we met for an hour. We came back in, nine of the 12 groups came back independent, we didn't talk to each other before with the same thing, that's to get kids to third grade reading and math proficiency levels. And when we looked at what does it take to get there, early beginning, healthy starts, family home visiting, <clears throat> good quality child care, school readiness, get them ready and prepared and ready with the school to receive them into kindergarten and get them on a trajectory toward graduation. And I walked away saying, we have every one of these programs in the state of Minnesota. It's our imperative that all of you who sit here today representing human services and health and as well as education and public health and others, that we do this work. It's not we need more services. I've mapped, if you go to this right here, if you look underneath, we've mapped well over 25, if not 30 plus publicly funded programs that could and or may touch a family's life by the youth and or the parents. So this isn't necessarily we need more program as much as it is I think we need, some could argue adequate funding in certain programs, but that's not why I'm here. Uh, some could uh, also, but argue how do we have more intentionality as a system along that lifespan up to age eight to make sure they're reaching their efficiency and proficiency levels. And what we've proposed, and we're ready to finalize this and get it implemented in 2017 amongst four school districts, and you can see the specifics. Um, one last thing though before we go, I wanna show you if you have any doubt to that, the science on the back side, we're all interested in good return on investments. If you look at the second slide down, these are good visuals on human brain development and the neuroscience. 
Um, doesn't say much for those of us who are over the age of uh, 24, however, since the brain development starts to slide in the wrong direction. But nonetheless, <laughs> if we don't get this right on the front end, we, we disproportionately will pay and have consequences downstream and come visit me and talk to me in corrections and jail reentry and other programs because there's a common denominator with that and our homelessness and others, and it's the missing of some educational attainment. But the second slide shows you the greatest public investment ROI, and basically when you get beyond age four and get to school, your ROI on any tax dollars invested starts to depreciate pretty significantly. If you look at this, here's what we want, what we're proposing that we're going to do, is on the bottom shows all the programming available in Dakota County between the public, private, nonprofit funding. Uh, most of the programs are going to fit within public health, education, social services, but we're also including the primary health as well because you can't do this work absent social behavioral health. And then if you look along the top, we've identified five key developmental milestone categories that we are going to assess. And then the red to your right are going to be key indicators that ride along all five <laughs> and in addition at each one of these. And as you will see, we're going to work to build a technology solution that then identifies the youth and their family. We will assess where they're at. The, the solution will say it's either red, yellow, or green. If it's yellow or red, we're going to stop the manufacturing line of doing work as we've always done it. And we're going to mobilize the system around this youth and this family to make sure any and everything done possible so as to get them back onto developmental track can be accomplished. So this holds the school system, it holds the social service delivery system, the nonprofit, and all of us collectively responsible to make sure everything is done so as to get that youth ready for educational success. Um, the other piece I will say as I turn it over to Dr. Webb is none of this would be possible if he and the other superintendents hadn't come you know, to the table saying we're in this business together and we all have the same committed end goal. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Harder and uh, Dr. Webb. Uh, just two or three minutes, and I know that okay. you've kind of got the flavor, but this is sure. really a very good example of what everybody wants to accomplish. So welcome to the committee, sir. Thank you. I'll give you my best two minutes. So as resources are tight, we always look for partners to maximize our resources. When Kelly called to say, uh, Dave just came back from Cambridge, I think uh, we need to work together to align our resources, I was in. We enlisted the West St. Paul superintendent, and hello, Matt. Um, and we just uh, also reached across to uh, both Burnsville and Invergrove Heights. So we found really the four highest poverty pockets in Dakota County to really try to reach more families and extend our resources. What we've done in just the first two years together is we now have third uh, three-year-old screening alignment amongst our four school districts. We have five-year-old kindergarten readiness alignment using the FAST system out of the University of Minnesota. We, uh, thanks to that, now when we received the VPK grant, being one of the higher poverty school districts in the state, uh, we were able to take FAST and use it into for four-year-old uh, VPK as well. So we have uh, really accountability for three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds in the South St. Paul and other school district systems. As a part of this conversation, Kelly sees that uh, South St. Paul is the highest poverty pocket in Dakota County. Uh, when Second Harvest knocked on his door, not a part of this program, but he sent them our way to be a trial in Dakota County. We are the first school district now to offer Second Harvest based out of our two elementary schools. And we're a, a model that they hope to replicate around Dakota County. WIC families, we worked for a year to try to uh, break through the red tape of data sharing to reach our highest poverty WIC families. We, after a year of working through legal, we're able to get a data release. So when the county workers meet with a family, they can put the school district data release in front of them. We now have two thirds of the families when they sign that data release, we either have them, they weren't on our census or they had incorrect information on our census. We're now reaching those families and they're coming into our ECFE, our ECSE, our VPK programs and getting access to our school district funds, which are already there. So uh, just 
as I close my two minutes, I also just want to uh, say we are the highest poverty pocket in the county. We also pay the highest rate of tax in the county due to the lack of equalization. So I just want to thank uh, again, uh, Carla, for your help, Sen Senator Nelson. Senator Weger, when you testified at AMSD two weeks ago, it meant the world to, to our school district that that was on your list of possibilities for this year. So thank you. Well, I wish I had more time, but this is really good. And uh, I believe that uh, someone from Dakota County will be presenting at the work group uh, next Thursday uh, as part of our effort. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Opat, welcome to the committee. And I'm glad to see you walking down. You're understanding the pace we're at here. You understand pace. You have a few people in your county to worry about, don't you? What's that now? You have a, you have a few people in your county to we worry about. We have a few. Yeah, we do have a few. And I am, uh, they're flying me solo up here. They're working without a net, so we'll do the best we can. Well, um, good it, afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Nice to have you here. So take eight or ten minutes and uh, tell us uh, all the amazing news of Hennepin County. Well, we, we do have some things to report and also some things I, I hope the committee will take into consideration. Mr. Chair and members, good afternoon. My name is Mike Opad and I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm very pleased to see the Senate focusing on how all Minnesotans can come together to provide better support to families and especially to the educational success and development of children. For some time, my colleagues and I on the Hennepin County Board have been wrestling with the question of how to best approach and improve outcomes for children and families we serve. Like many county boards in Minnesota, we are particularly concerned with the educational outcomes of our older foster children and others under county responsibility. In Hennepin County, we've, we've taken the term county-involved youth to uh, segregate, if you will, the, the kids that we are primarily uh, charged with helping. A little less than 10 years ago, we initiated a cohort study called AGRAD, where we tracked the supports we provided and the outcomes realized by county-involved youth. The most striking thing we found was that we had our first contact with these kids when they were very young. A conclusion we made was that we could have used earlier interventions to position them for success later on in life. In short, early investments in their lives from before birth to age five can save money and help kids succeed. What we are learning now is how to address the holistic needs of vulnerable children and strengthen their families so that everyone, but especially kids, are positioned for independence and success. Throughout the Hennepin County organization, we are working to move our responses to signs of distress earlier in our relationships with the, kids that, with the kids we see who are in trouble. Let me share with you a few examples. First, we've, we've ramped up our investment in targeted home visiting. Some of the other speakers mentioned that before. We've designed our system to focus resources on families most in need through a county, state, and federal partnership. Teen mothers, especially first-time mothers, rise to the top of those in need. We use evidence-based models that we know will reduce their health care costs, reduce the need for remedial education, and increase the family's self-sufficiency. Our trained health care professionals work with these families to teach them the basic care for their children, navigate chronic illnesses, and screen for possible developmental delays, assess their homes for safety and stability, and help them connect with resources and other trusted community providers to supplement the, the, support, the supports they need for success. I'm going to stop on my prepared remarks here and I'm going to let you know that we don't, we, we don't have this down perfectly yet because one thing I know we're doing but we have trouble admitting it or saying it at the top of every list is that we work to prevent second pregnancies by teens. This is at the, at the top of my list and has been so for more than a decade but I will tell you there is, we do have a little bit of, uh, of resistance to that within, within our own county culture. which it's, it's a hard conversation to have, I think, with some of our clients. I know we do have it, but we seem to be loath to, to say that. And so, you know, I know other folks are listening to my remarks here, so maybe they'll get, they'll get that message behind me as well as uh, you receiving it in front of me. Um, we also work hard to strike the balance and intervene at the right time for the right people. But I want to be clear that we don't think governmental responses are the only answer or that intervention programs should replace the responsibility of parents to raise their children. We all want every child to thrive in school, but many lack the support they need to do so. So we've invested heavily in early childhood development infrastructure and family supports, again, targeting our resources to families in need or at risk for their children falling behind. We are spending $200,000 annually in property tax dollars to train childcare providers to become quality rated under Minnesota's parent aware system. We made impressive gains in training providers to 
who serve low-income kids in communities of color, especially in areas of Hennepin, where our racial and economic disparities are greatest. We also partner with the state to utilize the basic sliding fee program and early learning scholarships. Regarding these financial supports for struggling families, I want to make two important points. One, demand is high. Last year, we spent over $3 million on high-quality child care for children whose foster parents must work. Again, these are property tax dollars. We also applied for and obtained state early learning scholarships for over 80 preschool age foster children. Secondly, I've, I fo we focus substantial county resources on young foster kids who come through child protection. Again, again, demand has outstripped our resources. Why? Changes made to the child protect so protection system, both legislative and administrative, had incre have increased our caseloads and created increased demand for services. In Hennepin County, make sure I'm on the right page. In Hennepin County, the number of, suspe of suspected maltreatment and neglect cases have doubled since you passed the reforms. We've increased the number of children we had to place in foster care, and their families and caregivers often need financial support for their education. When these children get the help that, and support they need, their chances improve, and we all win. I just touched on child protection. This is the final area of child well-being I'll mention. My remarks, uh, foster care arises out of, child, out of the county's duties and responsibilities with child protection. As you know, the state has assigned child protection to counties and that role we, we respond when parents are unable or unwilling to keep their children safe. Much attention has been paid to child protection in the past few years. In, in Hennepin County, we spent 2016 rethinking our system. Rather than continue to invest in deep end, in, in, in deep end responses designed around crisis response, we are developing a new practice model. Our Child Protection Oversight Committee, which I chaired, presented the board with a plan to redesign our system around child well-being. It is a comprehensive practice model change with the basic idea of positioning children to succeed and help their families support their success. This should not be about government taking on the role of parenting and keeping families out of trouble, but about positioning the families to make their own success. This redesign will take serious financial investment. We identified $26.1 million in additional costs over a five-year period as we shift to the new practice model. My fellow commissioners and I approved an initial investment of $13 million, and we invite the legislature to share in the reform and spread the, what works across Minnesota. My larger point is that we need to build a system that will help families and their children achieve sustainable success, not just end the crisis. We, we have the will and the data, but we can't provide the resources, resources alone. I want to leave you with these two thoughts. One, we will use the overall well-being of a child to frame our thinking in Hennepin County. Two, supports and intervention as early as, as possible will yield better results. A child well-being mindset will help us identify what families need to position children for success. We can choose to interact with these families on the front end or later when they're in deep crisis. I think we can all agree that when families need help, when parents and caregivers need real help, getting to them earlier in time is best. There's a business case to be made here and we intend to prove it in Hennepin County. We invite you to join us. I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, I'll just let you stand down for now. If you want to stay around, people might have questions. I do sure. want to just commend you for the best euphemism I've heard in a long time. The invitation to share in the reform. That's very good. I appreciate that. Well, we have 13 million reasons to invite you. And so. I appreciate that. Thank you. So um, I just have a few comments, and then I'll let uh, Senator Nelson do the Q&A part here. Um, so this, as, as fast as this was, I hope what people got was there's, there's a lot of programs. 10, 20, 30, who knows, lots of programs that touch these, these uh, zero to five uh, members of our, uh, of our communities. And sometimes they work really well and sometimes they're kind of randomly distributed and, and we put a lot of effort and, and uh, resources into these families and nothing happens that we had in mind. And, so, and sometimes there's stories that are amazing that we're proud to talk about. And so the goal of this project starting with this with the working group and the product that might come out of that and partly exemplified by what Dakota County is doing and the good intentions of uh, Hennepin County, what they presented, um, are to try to make it 
an intentional, focused, uh, good outcome. And my, I tell you, my bias is uh, mediated by the county. I think that's where we deliver our services, and I'm open, you know, functionality with the state and, and all that, but we do have a county-administered system. And just to remind you all, you're all invited, if you'd like to come, to the uh, working group. It starts tomorrow at nine, a week from tomorrow at 9 o'clock in room 2308. Uh, all members are welcome. We do have two co-chairs, bipartisan uh, pair of legislators. You're all welcome to come and uh, be a part of that. Uh, it will be some kind of dialogue, and the co-chairs will coordinate that. But uh, thank you for all the participants today and those who listened. But now, there's, I think some people might have questions, Senator. <laughs> thank Nelson. you, uh, Senator Abler. Well, really, uh, thank you to the uh, presenters. And um, so I know that I think committee members have been very patient with your questions. And so I uh, feel... Uh, let us know. We'll be sure to call on you for those questions. I would just uh, uh, echo uh, Senator Abler's comments and, and note, members, that we do have a large number of programs, uh, maybe some have said perhaps 30, uh, servicing kids one to five, zero to five. And um, on the spreadsheet that was, we started our presentation with here today, just looking at the state dollars, in the next forecast, there's about a billion dollars advocated to our youngest citizens. And uh, I think uh, the message that I got today, and I will say maybe I was already thinking this ahead of time, but it seemed to be just reinforced today, is that uh, it really behooves us to do uh, maybe a more collaboration, more coordination, and then uh, actually assessing and making sure that what we're doing is working, that our kids are being well prepared. So again, thank you for all who uh, brought um, presentations today. Members, uh, You've had to wait a long time. Do you have any questions uh, from the presentations today? If so, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Okay. Madam Chair, I just found the presentations really good and always informative, but I just thought of some encouragement to us to call attention to the, to the charts that we have, the first two charts. It's looking kind of tough on us. I just want to say, if you look at the bottom chart where it says executive function skills build throughout childhood and adolescence, maybe that'll be some encouragement to us, too. Thank we're you, Senator Kiffmeyer. All is lost we're all glad about that. After the age of five. <laughs> Any other comments or questions uh, with the committee members? Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it was. It was a great overview. I'm sorry I was late. I was uh, working my way down here, but it was a. It was a. It was a really good overview, and to hear the 30 different programs, and my mind started going back to the early 2000s when, when I got to serve on an interagency coordinating council on the federal level, and and there was one thing that that I pulled up, and it says the among the most important expected benefits of blending roles and merging responsibilities are better more cohesive service delivery and an associated decrease in the time and energy individuals with services needs and extend to an effort to receive appropriate government services. I was blown away by, uh, in, in, uh, Mr. Carter, if you could kind of talk briefly, and, and maybe this is for future discussion, your bullet point about improving alignment between state and community-based resources, I think is kind of an overarching theme of where we need to really look at. And it goes back to the 80s when we were told by the federal government to coordinate, collaborate, and be comprehensive in our services. So I'm glad you got the two C's of the three C's right there, Madam Chair. And I'm looking forward to working more with that. And thank you for highlighting that. I hope that's the merging theme about where we're going with this conversation. And I know there's lots of lessons learned that Commissioner Opat, um, there's some great uh, indications that, that are happening in Hennepin County and direction they're going, and, and I'm looking forward to having more discussion on that as well as what uh, Mr. Harder and, and Dakota County are doing as well. So I want to thank everybody for bringing that stuff forward, and, and thank you for having this joint meeting, because this is really a time for all agencies to start breaking down those silos and start looking at what's right for the individual youth and family. So thank you for, letting, for doing this. Any other questions, members? Oh, such a quiet group. Oh, yes, yeah, Senator Weger. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Kind of a basic question is how do we really know objectively what's working? Uh, each year there's about 70,000 babies born in the state. One baby, or excuse me, uh, eight babies during this hearing. Uh, if you look at the data on the demographic, demographic site, and we have a lot of programs that will you know, intervene, some that don't. 
everybody's doing their part, but when we look at key measuring sticks that we have for, in education, we do this through world's best workforce and we say we want students ready for K, but we don't have a state definition of that and leave that up to local districts to decide if it's a kindergarten readiness assessment, there's others, Dakota, maybe it's a local control issue, but we're, we put state dollars on these programs where we're expecting a deliverable of ready for K, and I assume that the, the health human service programs want ready for K with by addressing cognitive health, social, emotional, physical issues, but it's not being measured consistently or reported, and so I, and maybe the work group can look at that, but I've been posing this question for a few years and haven't been able to really see where it's going. Thank you, Senator Weger. Senator Abler. Well, welcome to my head. Um, scary or in each other's head about this, Senator Weger. Um, and I think one example that was just given to us today, Dakota County sat down and they came up with some, with some, some, key, with some key benchmarks um, that they thought were important and uh, critical points. Um, when I, this is my 18th year of privilege of serving in an elected office. Uh, when I first came in, one of the outcomes in the human servicing was happy clients. And, <laughs> which is nice though, they're happy. Um, and, uh, but so it's moved quite a ways along from that with some sort of outcomes. And I think as those outcomes are, you know, maybe all over the map, it, I think it's up, up to us maybe as uh, policymakers to help coerce the systems into outcomes that we find to be valuable. And I think Dakota County has given a good example of that in this part. And maybe with the work group and your own expertise and others can help tell the people who are doing out spending our $40 billion in all our programs what it is that we think we should be getting for that. And, and maybe some local control, certainly, but, um, but I, I think we're on the right track. And that, that my goal is a deliverable out of the four-week work group will be how can we operationalize what everybody said aspirationally here? And I think, uh, for lack of a better, uh, you know, here's, here's zero to eight for you. And, and I think with the expertise on this very joint committee, we could help them with that. That's my, that's, I hope that's gonna come true, so. Thank you, Senator Abler. And I think uh, just to add a little finer point to those um, already good comments is that um, we do need to have, um, some would call it accountability. I would call it more like, uh, let's see what works, which is uh, what Senator Weger alluded to. And so if we can focus our resources on what works, uh, that means we have to have some uh, somewhat objective measures. And uh, for just for starters, uh, we don't even have the same vocabulary. So when you think about eligibility, just today we saw some programs are uh, FPL, which might be free and reduced lunch, I'm not sure, or that it's a percent of FPG, Federal Poverty Guidelines, or it's a case, a percent of SMI, which I think is state median income. So at somewhere, we, we have to start having some of the same language, so we need to start using some of the same measures and looking at outcomes, and then uh, once we know, uh, when we have an idea of what's working, and this is where I look forward to seeing the data uh, later in the session here from these different programs uh, and different, um, opportunities then is how do we break down those silos, how do we collaborate, coordinate, and uh, to Senator Hoffman, be comprehensive. So uh, any other uh, comments or questions for the committee? Yes, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So what I was encouraged by this is the fact that um, it's a combination of uh, the benchmark of third grade reading. It's exciting to hear that because indeed if if a student is not reading at that level, at that degree, something is not right. Could be health, could be education, could be who knows what it may be. But to have the system focused around uh, finding out what that is and not waiting till third grade to find out you have a problem, you're a little late um, if that's the deal. The other thing is there are a lot of parents and a lot of families who are doing it right in our state. They're doing it well. 
they do. And there's a lot of love and heart and care for many people for their children, but maybe they just don't quite know how to do it. Sometimes you just give them some tools and they take off and do really, really well. So I appreciate the high risk focus because that's where most of the resources um, end up in the later time going. And but I think it's uh, encouraging to see it. The other thing is in seeing this list and some of the task force effort, um, redundancy. Uh, there were several times where I saw the same kind of subject. Well, it's kind of fitting what works, what can we combine, what can we do. And every now and then we kind of end up with a whole lot of different things and we need to take a look and say and reevaluate all of that. And I'm excited about the, the work group as well, but I just kind of wanted to bring that up to take a look beyond that and say, you know, where is redundancy? Where, because that's usually inefficiency also. Where is that which works well? Well, let's repeat it. And every now and then they kind of cobble up together, and it just happens. It's the nature of how they go. And every now and then we gotta take a look at that. So I'm encouraged by that, and very supportive, and looking forward for some good outcomes from our own work as well. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, seeing no other questions, let me just end with a brief announcement. Um, members, next week the Senate uh, Council Research and Fiscal Analyst staff, the fiscal staff, will provide a budget briefing. Uh, this is for um, K-12 finance of the various components of the state's budget. Uh, the briefing will be held over two days. It's open to Senate members and staff. Uh, so they'll have the whole budget. I'm going to just tell you about when the uh, E-12 budget briefing is. And that is at 10 o'clock on Thursday in this building in room 2412. So I'd encourage you to uh, pop in there and get uh, a briefing on the budget. I'll just remind members that it's about 42% of our state budget. So it's a, there's a lot to, to dig into there. So again, thank you so much. Uh, with that, the meeting's adjourned. <laughs>